Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this evening's lecture. Um, tonight, I'm delighted to be joined by Tom O'Neill. So Tom has an MA in history and has work, worked uh, with the prison service in Spike Island for many years. He's combined his love of history and his knowledge of Spike Island to write this book. Uh, you see it there, you see it in the background anyway on Tom's screen, um, which is Spike's Republican Prisoners 1921 which really is the only comprehensive history of prisoners and events on the island uh, during the War of Independence. Tom, you're very, very welcome to Tassin is here this evening. Liam, thank you very much. And I want to start really by thanking you for organizing this evening's event and for giving me the opportunity to tell so many people about my latest book, Spike Island's Republican Prisoners 1921, which is illustrated on the first slide. We crack on then. Yeah. Okay. okay Tom. Yeah. Thank you. Now, in the interest of continuity this evening, then questions will be dealt with at the end of the presentation. And so that you're not, you're, you're not going to be, not all of you are going to be here for this evening. I have broken down tonight's presentation into two parts. The first is a short, approximately 15 minute presentation about my new book, the background to Spike in 1921 and Spike Island 2021. And the second half then is really just an enlargement of those stories for those of you that want to stay and find out a little bit more. For those of you that may not be certain as to where Spike Island is, that's the purpose of this slide. And you can see Spike Island, I just need to change the point or options. Uh, Spike Island is down here on the south coast of Ireland. And again, a closer up, it's in the lower Cork Harbour, opposite the town of Cove. And just some of the reference points, Cork City, it's approximately 12 miles, about 15 or 16 kilometers to the northwest. Cork Airport is just, uh, just down here. There's the M8 down from Dublin and the N25 from Ross Lair. So it's well serviced for um, tourism and all of that. So that's where Spike Island is. And this is what it looks like. So there's the 104 acres of Spike Island and at the top of the island is the fort, which is the, the center of the, the story this evening, because that's where the military prison was located during 1921. And again, a reference point, here we have the only entrance into or out of, entrance into or exit out of Cork Harbor. A close up then, an aerial view of the fort, more or less as it is today, a couple of, uh, um, a, a, a couple of improvements, but that, that is the, the fort surrounded by a dry ditch. And there is the entrance, the present day entrance to Fort Mitchell or the, now the tourism site on Spike Island, or as it was in 1921, Fort, Westmor Fort Westmoreland, and the title of the prison in 1921 was the military prison in the field. The Irish War of Independence then, during the War of Independence, Fort Westmoreland, Dunspike Island was primarily a British Army coastal fortification for the defense of Cork Harbor. And the opening up of a prison on Spike Island was in addition to its primary role of coastal forts. And during 1921, there were Republican prisoners and internees held on Spike Island. More about the, the difference between those shortly. And that's a drawing that we've made up in, uh, in 2021, just to illustrate where the, the various locations were in the fort in 1921. So the prison was opened 
on the 19th of February, 1921, for convicted Republican prisoners and the internees. And the locations then, when it opened, there, there's your entrance to the fort, the only entrance. And down here, we have what we refer to as the North East casemates. North is, is this way, down to the bottom of the photograph, so North East casemates. And when the first internees were transferred to Spike on the 19th of February, 1921, this is where they were held. And they were held there until the end of March, early April, when they were transferred across here. What had happened was, at that stage, Republican prisoners were held on Bear Island, and it was quickly realized that Bear Island was just not secure enough for them. So what the British authorities decided to do was move all the Republican prisoners that were on Bear Island to Spike Island. So this area was vacated. The internees were moved over to the A block, which is the yellow one, and the B block, which is the orange one. And that vacated the Northeast casemates for the newly arrived prisoners then from Bear Island. And to give you an idea then of what the, the A block looked like, I have a photograph of the A block, and the B block consisted of 25 of those standard wooden huts that were in every barracks around the, and, and fort throughout the world really, uh, owned by the British Army. And in fact, the Irish Army had them for years afterwards. And this then is the A block. So that's where the internees were. And as it looks like today, and the 25 wooden huts were in here. And the Northeast casemates is this corner of the fort. Now, the internees in A block, 25 wooden huts for the B block. The cells then, because the cell is a term associated with criminals, the Republican prisoners and internees generally refer to their accommodation, let's call it, as a hut. So regardless of whether they were in the limestone, A block, or Northeast casemates, or in the wooden huts, they generally refer to them as huts. Now, during 1921, there were male prisoners and internees on Spike Island, and male prisoners and internees only. As a matter of interest, the British authorities had decided that they would not intern any females in Ireland, but there were male and female prisoners, but only male ones on Spike Island. And the difference between the internees and the prisoners, the internees were Republicans that were imprisoned without trial for their suspected involvement in Republican activities. And they were probably the, the most difficult in terms of they were interned, there was no limit on their internment. Whereas at least with the prisoners who were arrested, charged, tried, convicted and sentenced by military courts, they were given a release date. In fact, they were given two release dates, their actual release date. So for example, if they received a sentence of six months, well, six months to the day after that sentence was handed down, they were to be released. Whereas they got a second date then, which was um, a, a fraction less, a percentage less for good, good behavior. Now, one very interesting uh, situation that evolved was that prisoners that received short custodial sentences, maybe three months or six months, and that were still imprisoned before the treaty was signed, were given their release. They were legally released. And if the authorities believed they were still a threat, then they were certainly released, but almost immediately handed an internment order. And what that meant on Spike Island was they were released down to Northeast casemates, and quickly matched up and incarcerated in the internment compound of either A or B blocks. Now, 
I mentioned then that the prisoners were tried by military courts. Why? Because the eight counties that the, the book covers would, were the six counties of Munster and then two counties in South Leinster, Kilkenny and Wexford. And these were considered the most dangerous and most violent counties on the island of Ireland during the War of Independence. And just to give you an idea why, because between the 1st of June 1920 and the 10th of April 1921, just to pick that, that segment of time, 14 British Army officers, 54 British Army enlisted ranks, and 101 members of the police, that would be regular RIC, Black and Tans or Auxiliary Police, were killed or lost their lives as a result of IRA activities in the martial law area in that time. Probably more than the remainder of the, the country together. And because there, there, there were such sustained attacks on the, the police and on the, the rule of law or the, the actual um, the British, um, we will say, establishment in that area, the RIC were becoming helpless. They could only operate with the direct, as we would say, assistance or support of the, the army. So the British authorities decided to um, in, introduce martial law or military law. So now the military were in control up to and including military courts. And the martial law then, as I mentioned, the six counties of Munster that are listed there and Wexford and Kilkenny, because they were the most violent counties. <clears throat> In order then for the, the British military to attempt to control that area then, the area that was decided on, those eight counties, that was the area of operations of the British armies. Just need to clear something here now. That was the um, the area of operations of the British Army, 6th Division. And for operational control then, the 6th Division was broken down into four brigades of that division. And those four brigades were the 16th Brigade, headquartered in the old barracks in Fermoy, responsible for that area of North Cork, Waterford, Kilkenny and Wexford. The 17th Brigade, which was co-located co in Victoria Barracks in Cork with 6th Division headquarters. And the 6th, 17th Brigade, their area was West Cork, Cork City and East Cork, and parts of North Cork. The 18th Brigade then, headquartered in the barracks in Limerick, was responsible for counties Clare, Limerick and parts of Tipperary. And the last one, then the fourth one, the Kerry Brigade, amazingly, with its headquarters in County Cork and Burston Barracks, was responsible for all of County Cork and parts of North West, sorry, all of County Kerry and North West Cork. Something that's very important for you to consider when you're researching then the prisoners or internees that were incarcerated in the martial law area, because so many uh, had, had, had the same name. For example, at one stage, I had 14 um, James Barrys from Cork. And how was I going to distinguish between them? And how was I going to track them moving from one location to another? And that then is where a very important information Every Republican arrested, interned, imprisoned in the 16th Brigade area was given a unique 
brigade reference number beginning with 16 IB plus a number of figures which were their unique. So every one of them got 16 IB and then the unique element of it. And likewise then with the 17th and 18th, the very same, 17 IB, 18 IB, and those arrested in the Kerry Brigade area, KB and the numbers. And that's very important if you're tracking somebody, just like if you're tracking somebody or researching somebody in the army, you depend on and you rely on their army number. Well, this was their brigade arrest number, very important. Spike then, the military prison in the field, which was like an intern, which was like um, a prison of war camp, was opened from February to November 1921. During that year, 888 internees or those in prison without trial were held there and 281 prisoners tried by military courts, convicted and sentenced. I mentioned about prisoners uh, to internment. And they, I, I can't actually see, one second now, I can't see the very bottom line, one second now. Um, oh yes, I think I, if what's there is, there were approximately 500 in the, intern, in the military prison field at any one time. There's a black bar across the screen and I, I what's behind it is, is, is blinding me. Now, that's the cover then of my new book, my latest book, Spike Islands Republican Prisoners. And I have just, I'm going to leave you read that yourselves, the contents page. But in reality, every element of the story, every connection with the story that I thought would be of interest to the reader is included. So you can actually see it's far more than just uh, like a telephone list of the names and addresses of the men were there. So you can see the background. How was there a breakdown in civil law? What were the IRA formations? The British Army, I like, I, I like to have the books balanced as well then, so that there, there is, as much space as I can give both the IRA side of the story and the Crown Forces. Balance is always very important for me. I've also listed and detailed the other prisons and internment camps in the martial law area. And then the, the day by day, day to day events on Spike Island are, are covered. And of course, at the very end, then down to, uh, in the bottom of the main section, then are the alphabetical lists and details of the 1200 men that were held on Spike Island that year. It's also worth noting then that while the book is primarily about the Republicans that were imprisoned or interned on Spike Island, I've also included where the information was available, where the men were transferred to Spike Island from, and where they were transferred from Spike Island to. So for example, if somebody is interested in Kilworth Camp, there are 400 references to Kilworth Camp in the book. Bear Island, there are approximately 300. And again, in the appendices, likewise, any bit of information I thought, any story I thought that the reader would be interested in. And after all, that I was interested in because I wanted to find out the full story as well. So what I've done is I've shared as much information I have with the reader. I wanted really the book to be a one-stop shop. And the book also then includes the background to the setting up, as you can see from the, the index, and a day-to-day -day account of the events on the island. The opening of the prison. Incidentally, it's just, a, obviously, um, it just happened by chance that my second last book was about the, the, the Battle of Clanmult, which happened just um, probably about, what, 20 kilometers northeast of, of Spike Island. 
where it just happens to be a massive coincidence that the prison was opened on the Saturday, the 19th of February, and Tanmult was the following day, the 20th. Both very um, important events in the history of, of, of Dwarven independence, and obviously, specifically, East Cork that, uh, in 1921. Uh, now, the details of the prisoners, details of the internees, and the bibliography, and as I mentioned, a balanced account. Now, there are extensive lists then of the prisoners, and the same with the internees, they're in alphabetical sequence, and each one of the, the men has his own paragraph, and where available, a photograph. So everything is condensed then. So if you're looking for a particular individual, it's all in one paragraph, one section of the page. And if he doesn't have a photograph, if, he, if there was a photograph, uh, it, it, it's beside the paragraph. Now, and for example, here, here we can see just uh, one, one page. I didn't um, pick this page by chance. The specific reason I picked this photo, this page, is it just shows the conflict and the, the contradictions in loyalties in Ireland during the War of Independence. Because that man here, Joseph Cosgrove, who was an internee on Spike Island, his brother won the Victoria Cross with the Royal Mount of Fusiliers in Gallipoli. So you can see the difference in two members of the one family in East Cork. And this is another one then, again, just to show you a snapshot of a page. And again, um, Richard, uh, we'll say just John Barrett, you can see now his brigade arrest number is there. He was transferred from to, and even down to where possible, the, the hut that he was in. So for example, this man was in A block hut 19. We can actually show his relatives or anybody interested where Hut 19 is, uh, was or is, I mean, the building is still there. Amazingly, the internees uh, destroyed the A block in a riot in 1921, just like the modern prisoners did in uh, 31st of August, 1985. And of course, in the bibliography then, I've just added another page then with the, the details of the medals that were awarded to the War of Independence veterans. Now, for those of you then from various counties, I have put together this particular chart. And it is a breakdown of the prisoners and the internees from the various counties that were imprisoned on Spike Island. In the case of counties, not in the martial law area, that's very simply explained. That particular individual from Dublin, he was from Dublin, but he was arrested in the martial law area. And if we go to Westmead, it's there somewhere. It's actually hidden behind this black bar that I can't see. Um, you'll see that there's just one internee from Westmead, and that was the famous Tom Malone, one of the most hunted and most wanted uh, Republicans in the country. And they didn't realize that he was um, a prisoner on Bear Island and transferred to Spike Island because he was uh, Tom Malone. He escaped from Mount Jai, first of all, and he went on the run to County Limerick where he went under the alias Sean Ford. He was arrested by auxiliary police in Cork City on a, a, on a delayed honeymoon on Christmas morning, 1920, and um, imprisoned, first of all, in Cork Mail Jail in, on Bear Island and Spike Island from where he escaped. So that's the, uh, the reason for some of them um, being from counties outside the eight previously mentioned. The uh, target market then is, just close that again, is relatives of the men, 
historical research, local, national, international historians, uh, lecturers, writers, and collectors of uh, Irish memorabilia. The primary source for the book then, the vast majority of the original information, and I would almost, I would actually go so far as to say that without the quantity and quality of the information in the UK National Archives and Q, the book, it wasn't a case of wouldn't be, but couldn't be written. Um, the original information is available in queue. It's, uh, I'm sure most of you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an outstanding place to carry out research. Uh, the, the second then source of, of, of the primary source of information was from Irish military archives and primarily through the witness statements. But we also have 22 original or copies of original prisoners and internally autographed books on Spike Island. Again, that's the source then of the more specific, <clears throat> excuse me. So why we know that Dick Barrett was uh, an internee on Spike Island, the reason we know the hut he was in and all of that was because that would have been found in the autograph books or private papers and diaries. In effect, we had a fabulous donation to the Spike Museum only last, last Sunday. It was all the documents and letters, the original letters written uh, by one of the internees from County Tipperary. William Luby was his name and uh, written to his, his sister. Now, uh, again, the book consists is, is 336 pages, which is quite substantial, approximately 200 photographs, maps and drawings, and individual photographs of approximately 180 of the men, including the, the two that you saw there a while ago of Dick Barrett and Cosgrove. And um, signed copies are available direct from the author, from myself. I'll give you the details later. And uh, postage is six euro within the island of Ireland or 10 euro for postage to the UK and Europe. Yes, I, again, this black line has caused me problems here. Um, it's available then from uh, most bookshops and uh, from, um, yeah, I say I can't see that. And then from the Spike, uh, Spike gift shop, I say that middle, le the middle line I can't, see but maybe you can. Now then in order to commemorate these men 100 years later we have a special exhibition then a centenary exhibition on Spike Island which is certainly worth visiting and it's to sort of the honour and the, the bravery and the sacrifice of these heroes um, and their families. It's always very important to remember that because most of these men were the breadwinners, then in, in, in actual fact, the, the primary sacrifice was by their families, because now the breadwinner was, was a dependent and the people that had, were now at home had to pick up the slack and support the, the now um, dependent previously breadwinner. For anybody interested in going to Spike Island then, which is a world class tourist attraction, I have a phone number and uh, an email address. So feel free to advertise, to, um, to inquire and highly uh, recommended. And for anybody interested in purchasing a copy of the book direct from myself, um, 20 euro plus postage, or if you're living close, near, nearby, uh, that's my uh, contact details and my email address. And that's the end of part one. So for those of you that are sort of cut for time, you, you now have the, um, a brief account of the story of Spike Island and the book. And I'm now just going to extend an invitation to anybody that wants to get um, a broader 
account of the event on Spike Island that um, we, I'm now just going to continue into the, the second part. So for anybody that needs to depart, so thank you very much for, for attending this evening. Now, this is a photograph then of Major Kennedy, King's Own Scottish Borders, and he was the camp commandant on Spike Island for most of it. And all of the information that was in queue, for example, the nominal roles of prisoners and internees were signed by Major Kennedy. And what we did, we've produced certificates on Spike Island that were available to family uh, members or indeed anybody that's looking for a certificate on a particular individual. And to give it a, a semblance of officialdom, the certificates are signed by Major Kennedy. And the prison and the field at Bike Island then, it was in the 17th Brigade area. Nevertheless, the internees and the prisoners that the authorities had decided to transfer to Spike were transferred from all over the divisional area. So the internees and prisoners from the 17th Brigade area generally were transferred from what was referred to as the Brigade Cage in Victoria Barracks. That was a holding compound, just a word in compound at the, at the corner of the Barrack Square in Victoria Barracks, where mobile and uh, foot British Army patrols would, would uh, get rid of their prisoners or internees. And then after going through the process, they would have been transferred to either Spike Island or Bear Island. Again, the vast majority of the internees from the 16th Brigade area then, they were transferred to Spike from Kilworth, and others then, prisoners and internees, were transferred from Waterford and Kil Waterford, Kilkenny, and Limerick jails. And there were lots then of transfers to and from Cork Mail Jail. Cork Mail Jail, CMG, was the civil prison in Cork. Now, there were a number of them in Cork, but this was in the, it's, it's demolished since, but it's in the grounds. It was located in what are now the grounds of UCC. Another location in Cork that a high percentage of the prisoners and internees came from was the military detention barracks just at the back of what is now Collins Barracks. And the military detention barracks was the civil prison in Cork, I'd say for about 50 years from the early 70s until about 19, uh, 2015 or so. And obviously lots of transfers uh, to and from Bear Island. All of the internees then were served with an internment order. You can see order under martial law. And this one is to a John Hennessy from Ballano, who was an internee. He was interned from the 16th Brigade area, went through Kilworth, transferred to Spike. We have his original diary that was held and that was written on Spike, on Spike. And you can see all this particular internment order, indeed all of them, sentenced the internees to the, you can see the candidate um, will be sort of sent to Spike Island or Bear Island. So shall be interned in the military internment camp at Spike or Bear Island. Now, just briefly, the day by the, the day to day events. So it opened on, on Saturday, the 19th of February, and only internees were sent there first. And the internees were primarily from the prisons in Cork City, and they were incarcerated in the Northeast casemates. And as was the case with the first internees that were sent in there, that you can see by the brigade arrest number that they, some of them were arrested together because they, they were numbered in consecutive. On the 1st of April, then, the internees were moved from the Northeast Casemates to A Block 
and into the B block to make you to make space for the first Republican prisoners. And how that came about was on the 14th of April, there uh, quite a few extra internees were transferred from the other prisons to Spike Island. And what were referred to as the most dangerous and the least likely to be released internees were transferred then by Royal Navy destroyer to Bear Island. And when they were lodged in the, the camp on Bear Island, all of the prisoners that were on Bear Island were put on the destroyer and brought back to Spike Island. And not too, not too long after that, then just two weeks later, the, the first and only occasion where prisoners escaped from Spike Island, uh, three of them escaped um, on the Saturday, the 29th of April. And these are the three. Sean Maxweeney, brother of the by then uh, former and deceased Lord Mayor Terence Maxweeney, he had died in on hunger strike previous October. This was the Tom Malone mentioned earlier, the man from County Westmead, changed his name to Sean Ford, but when he was arrested in uh, what is now McCurtain Street. Um, on uh, Christmas Day 1920, he knew that if he gave the auxiliaries his alias, Sean Ford, they would have shot him on the spot. So he gave his real name. So that's the unusual. He was wanted under the alias, but he was imprisoned under his real name. And the third man that escaped was Kantumi. And the details of all that escape are in the book. and. The escape would not have happened without the essential assistance of the prison chaplain, Father John Calnan, because he was the, the conduit, if you like, he was the, the, the man that liaised between the prisoners and the IRA and Cove. So with, with, with Father Calnan taking the information to the IRA, they were able to, the IRA and Cove were able to uh, organize a boat and some volunteers. And of course, the three prisoners then, they very kindly volunteered their service to the British Army to assist in the maintenance of the nine hole golf course that was built for the officers, uh, the British Army officers around the fort. And of course, that meant then the most difficult part of the escape was completed. They were outside the fort. Uh, what happened then? The IRA came along and uh, lifted them. Now it's more exciting than that, but I leave I leave the story for the book. Then on the thirty first of May, then internee Patrick White was fatally shot by a British sentry while playing hurling. Now, when we read about this and read the military court of inquiry and move an inquest that uh, in Q UK National Archives. I, I wasn't um, I, I wasn't satisfied with that. I said, right, what really happened? Why? Because he was only playing hurling. He was outside his barbed wire compound because the internees were allowed to play hurling and football out on the parade ground or the barrack square. So he was actually outside of his compound. And if he had managed to get through the wire that the sentry uh, claimed he was tampering with, well, it meant that he was into the more higher secure area back inside his compound. So the question was why? So I didn't have far to go. Earlier that morning, the uh, IRA, two IRA volunteers in Yall, County Cork, about, again, about maybe 30 miles to the northeast, blew up a six-inch shell. And um, while the British Army band was leading, a company of soldiers to the to the to carry out annual range practice with uh, light machine guns, and seven members of the band were killed. Now again, it's far more extensive than that, but that was the basics of it. And the sentry then, Private Whitehead, shot White that evening. Then, and that was definitely a reprisal. And even one or two of the of the Republican internees that were playing hurling with White actually mentioned that in their statement. 
that White was shot as a reprisal for that bomb attack. The story is in, in the book. Then, of course, we it couldn't have been a, a story of a, a, a prison without having hunger strikes and, and riots. And there were two hunger strikes, one by the prisoners, one by the internees, began on the 30th of August. And, and an amazing fact was that the prisoners went on hunger strike for improved conditions, and the internees went on hunger strike for unconditional release. Because, of course, the big difference now was that the truce was after kicking in on Monday, the 11th of July. And the prisoners, and particularly the internees, were adamant that when the truce started, they should be released. The reality is the British authorities couldn't possibly agree to release either of them, because by that, at that time, there were approximately 4,000 Republicans, either prisoners or internees, in prisons across the country, which was a major percentage of their fighting element. And I would speculate that if the prisoners are and the internees had been released shortly after the truce, the truce possibly wouldn't have lasted very long. And of course, another major um, advantage that the British had when they were um, negotiating the treaty was 35 Republicans were imprisoned on, and on the sentence of death. And regarding the hunger strikes, then both groups abandoned their strikes after about four days. And then on the 16th of October, the internees tried again and failed in a hunger strike. So they decided, right, well, there's only one way to force the British authorities and specifically the British Army um, into releasing them. And that was riot and destroy their accommodation, destroy the the huts or the rooms inside in the A block and the wooden huts of the B block. That didn't work either. But as a result of that riot, the internees were forced out into the moat where they endured three, endured three horrible, wet, cold uh, nights in the moat without shelter. Because even when they were allowed back in, they were inside in uninhabitable um, accommodation because they had wrecked it. There's a photograph then of Captain Patrick White shot while playing hurling. He was the only prisoner or internee fatally shot, or put another way, shot and died while on Spike Island. There were two other internees shot while they were out in the moat, and coincidentally, both of them had their big toes blown off and one of them died of sepsis the following November in the uh, military hospital in Victoria Barracks. But White was the only man to be shot and subsequently die on Spike. Then on the 10th, 11th of November, then 17 internees escaped. And on the 16th of November, the last Republican prisoners were moved from Spike to Kilkenny Jail from where they were released in January of 1922. And on the 18th of November then, all the internees on Spike were moved to Maryborough Portage Prison. And that meant then the military prison on, in the field on Spike Island was closed. The internees were released nationally on or around the 10th of December after the treaty was signed. But the prisoners were not released nationally until January of 1922, which was a month after the uh, internees, but only after the treaty was ratified. So bear that in mind that the signing of the, the, the treaty in, Dublin, in, in London was really just the, 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 um, the negotiators signing it. It had to be ratified in the parliament in London, in Belfast, in Dublin before it became law. Back to the escape of the internees. So 10th of November, seven um, internees. Dick Barrett, we saw him earlier, amazingly escaped from Spike Island on the 10th of November. 
captured in the fall of the forecourt the following June and executed as a reprisal, executed with uh, three of his colleagues as a reprisal for the assassination of a, of a sitting TD in Dublin. So they were executed 8th of December 1922, one from each of the four provinces. Uh, Patrick Buckley um, and, and the other three then, Tom Flavin, uh, Eddie, uh, Jack Eddie, Henry O'Mahony, Bill Quirk and uh, Moss Toomey, bottom right. Moss Toomey later became chief of staff of the IRA. I want to go back to Tom Flavin for a second. Tom Flavin in the research broke my heart. Of, of all the 1200, he was the most difficult because obviously he escaped from Spike Island. Therefore, he had to be there. And incidentally, the name he, he had, his real name was Tom Crofts. And of course, because Tom Crofts was in every account of the escapes from Spike Island in several books, Tom Crofts had to be on Spike Island. Excuse me. But no matter where I checked, the nominal roles in queue, autograph books, Tom Crofts did not appear anywhere. And of course, when I couldn't find Tom Crofts, I then asked myself, well, how many more Tom Crofts am I missing? until I received a document from the History Department in UCC about a lecture that was given by one of the Clan Mult survivors to his colleagues in 1971, where he mentioned how he was released from the military hospital because he'd been shot in the mouth after surrendering at Clan Mult. But he was released from the military hospital and he was put into the brigade cage, which I mentioned earlier, where he met his old friend, Tom Crofts, who was interned as Tom Flavin. So then when I went all to the nominal role, there was Tom Flavin. And that just gives an idea of, of, of the shenanigans really that went on. There were several occasions where individuals gave false names, false addresses. In, in fact, that, um, that, that fabulous um, artifacts uh, that, that we were presented with last Sunday, William Luby, his name was L-O-O-B-Y. But in all of the accounts of, of Spike Island, he's L-U-B-Y. And he's in the book as L-U-B-Y. And that then was also to throw the British authorities off, not necessarily his track, because he was imprisoned, but the track of his colleagues or his family. Likewise, all of the prisoners and internees from a place called Belly Longford uh, in County Kerry, gave County Cork as their uh, county of address. So that was part of the difficulties of trying to track these individuals down. And I've mentioned that the internees were released nationally December after the treaty was signed, prisoners released nationally uh, January after the treaty was ratified. Now, Spike Island is now a world-class a world tourist attraction and 104 acres of beautiful walks, history of artillery. We have a very substantial collection of real artillery, not photographs, but everything from cannon, rifle cannon, field guns, anti-tank guns, coastal guns. We have a connection with the, well, obviously, chronologically then, um, the story of the convict there on Spike Island within those dates is told in a um, very um, moving exhibition of, of, of what the, the plight of those prisoners. And of course, it, it's, it amazes people to look at the cells that those unfortunates were housed in uh, versus the, the modern prison, which only closed in 2004. Spike Island then has a direct connection with 1916 because the crew of the gun running ship Odd were held on 1916 after the Odd was scuttled at the entrance to Cork Harbour. The Spike Island Independence Museum then is specifically the story of the prisoners and internees that were on Spike Island. We have medals belong to the men. Again, to mention the, the Luby um, collection last Sunday, 
because William Luby died in uh, 1937, his black and tan medal is officially named and numbered. We have some of the weapons, 22 autograph books. We have a nice collection of the original jewellery that the internees and prisoners made in 1921 from coins. Look, if it, uh, some of it is Celtic design, um, we, we'll say uh, jewellery tower brooches, uh, rings, all of that. And if you look at the reverse of them, you'll see what was the remains of maybe what some of the older listeners will remember as a two shilling piece or a half crown. And we've some original um, internment orders relating to the men held there. Again, this is the contact details for organizing a tour. Well worth the visit and tours depart from Cove. Nearly there, again, the Spike Island book, available all over the place. It's available online. It's available from most uh, gift shops and, 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 and bookshops. And, um, and I've just taken the opportunity now to advertise my second one then, which of uh, my second last one, the story of the Battle of Clanmult. End of presentation. Thank you all very much. Any questions? Hey, Tom, I have a couple of questions I've captured here from the chat box. Um, the first one's from Bernie. Bernie's question is, was Spike Island used at all during the Irish Civil War? No, the, the, the simple answer to that is no. And why? Because during the treaty, the British delegates realised that they were going to lose most of the island of Ireland. And what was very important for the defence of mainland UK was having Royal Navy ships based around the entire island of Ireland. And of course, Cork Harbour, Bear Haven, and Loch really were the three important ones for them. So in the treaty, it was agreed that the Royal Navy could continue to use those three harbours, Cork Harbour, Lock, um, Locksville and Donegal and Bearhaven as to defend, to patrol the entire island of Ireland after Ireland became independent. And in order then to protect the, the moorings for those ships, the four forts in Cork Harbour remained in British hands until 1938. Therefore, during the Civil War, the fort on Spike Island was a British Army fortification. And of course, the British, the British authorities had to keep, at least to be seen, to keep out of the Civil War. Great. Thanks for that, Tom. Um, a question here from Rob Duggan. Um, were men given POW status and did Geneva rules apply? Were there any escapees? No. The, 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 it was all but POW without officially um, recognizing it or stating recognition. But if you read the day by day, the day to day account in the book and the way it was, it was actually run. Prisons are run, by the way, with the um, or almost with the acceptance of the prisoners. Because, so here, the, the chain of command existed for both the internees and the prisoners and there were what was called staff officers ira staff officers for the internees and for the prisoners and that was your chain of command so it was very much pow without the status now regarding the escapes then the three prisoners that escaped in april they could have been hunted down and obviously an attempt was made to hunt them down. Whereas the internees that escaped on the 10th of November, I'm stating the obvious, had to escape to get their freedom. But once they escaped, they could have turned up at the boat and cove the following morning, say, listen, would you ever send a message to my colleagues to send out my, my, my property? because of the truth, they could not be hunted down and rearrested. So that was the difference and the major difference between the two. 
any of the prisoners or internees that escaped anywhere during the post uh, truce could not be hunted down because the Crown Force were confined to barracks after the truce. That's great. Thanks, Tom. I have a question here from uh, Colm O'Rourke. Uh, Colm is working on a very interesting project at the moment. Uh, he's compiling a list of all the Republican days uh, right through from 1916 to the, the uh, mid-1920s. So he's, he's a massive task ahead of him. And he's got a question probably related to, to the work he's undergoing. So his question is, apart from uh, Daniel Clancy and Patrick White, are there any others who succumbed to ill health on Spike Island? And do you know if any photographs exist of um, Clancy? Because I think in, in Colin's book, he's hoping to have a, a picture of uh, all of the fatalities as well. So that's his interest there. Right. We, we don't have any, uh, we don't have an account of any other fatalities on the island. I do know there, there is an account in one of the other reports, and probably a newspaper, of a prisoner that's not, that wasn't named being sent up to the military hospital in Victoria Barracks, but he's not named. Now, regarding Daniel Clancy, I can tell you, I don't even have to look at it, he's from, I think, Farron Dangle above in Cantork in North Cork. Best of luck if you can get a photograph. I have tried every angle. There is a photograph in existence. The family do have it. I think there's just one member of the family now at this stage, but not interested. And um, I, I failed and I had a few contacts tried. So yes, there is a photograph of Daniel Clancy, but I failed to get it. Best of luck. And you might share it with me if you do get it. I think you've thrown down the gauntlet there. Tom. I have, I, I certainly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, I have another question, Tom, from from Des Dalton. Uh, he's interested. Des is a, uh, a Kildare man, a sport of Kildare GA. So uh, his question is: Who is the internee from County Kildare? Right now, without going through the book, I, I would I would actually have to do a, a word search on that. But I, I can I can picture him. I don't have a photograph of him. But what, what I will do is when this uh, presentation is over, I'll email you, I'll email Liam um, the, the, the details of that. Of course, he could buy the book and search himself, but that might be unfair. Yeah, I, I, I'll send that on. OK, and I'll forward that on to Des. Uh, yeah, Des, yeah, Des, yeah. Liam, thanks, Tom. And one, one final one before we let you go. Uh, just a general one, I suppose, with Spike and uh, the Cora, why were prisoners also required to be sent up to County Down? Give me that now again. Why were prisoners? So, so with, with Spike um, and the Cora camp, so we had, we had uh, down in the southern half, we, we had two camps. Why was it also necessary to send prisoners up to County Down during the War of Independence? Okay, yeah, okay, right. Now, Again, go back to the martial law. The internees were transferred from Cork and specifically from Kilworth and places like that, right up to and only up to about the first or second week of January 19, um, January 1921. Now, I need a bit of leeway on that one. But what actually happened specifically was that when martial law was declared, now martial law was declared initially at the end of 1920 and it was extended early 1921. And that brought a totally separate legal process into the two halves. So you, you, can, you can consider the eight counties of the martial law area because they were under military law. That was a different legal process up to, by the way, including executions, because the executions in the martial law area were by firing squad. Outside, they were by hanging. And the, the massive difference was that in the martial law, it was declared that any individual, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm 
sought to ad-libbing this one now, any individual found in possession of weapons, explosives, or ammunition was liable to, be, to suffer death on conviction. And that was not the case then outside the martial law area. So really, as soon as martial law area came in, there were no more prisoners, or I think specifically internees, transferred up to Belly Kindler. That only changed then after the truce, when obviously martial law ceased to, 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 to be in force. And that is how then the internees were transferred from Spike to Maryborough in November of 1921, because the situation had changed. So there were no more transfers to Ballykindler from the martial law area after around January or February of 1921, because in effect, uh, that guy Hennessy now, for example, you saw his internment order earlier, he was transferred, he was one of the first transferred from Kilworth to Spike, and the road from Kilworth to Spike follows parallel to the M8, and until they turned left, when he hit the, obviously it was the M8 then, and he started heading east. He said, actually, we're not going to Valley Kindler because if we were going to Valley Kindler, we'd be going to the city and getting on a train. So you can see how, how tight it was there. So introduction of martial law, no more going to Valley Kindler from the south. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Tom. Uh, Tom, there's loads of comments coming in here, uh, all highly complimentary. They've all really enjoyed the lecture and they all asked me to pass on uh, their thanks. So thanks a million for joining us this evening. I've certainly learned a lot. I'm sure everyone else has. And uh, I've got your book already, but anyone else who hasn't, hasn't got it, uh, be sure and grab it. It's a, it's a fantastic read. I, I've certainly come across a lot of people mentioned in it that, um, that uh, I've learned a lot about. A lot of uh, people I, 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 I'm interested in history with, you know, the, the uncles, grand uncles, grandfathers that are, that are coming up there. So a fascinating uh, lecture. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we'll have you back again for your next book. Liam, thank you very much. And thanks, uh, thanks to all your listeners and best of luck to them. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Start on. Start on.